Uh, today we're going to continue uh, life lessons from David and, and go ahead and pop that uh, uh, verse up. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And I just, I'm not taken away from the word of God, but I'm, I'm just amplifying it. He will do everything I want him to do, and he'll do some things that I didn't endorse him to do. And that's going to segue into what we're talking about today. Some people read things in the Bible and they say, well, God's okay with that. No, he's not. Not when you read the whole story. It, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean God was given his seal of approval. It just means it was in there and it was a story in David's life and it actually happened. Last week we talked about, um, and I, I just want to re-emphasize this because I think it really ties in with today's lesson, is last week we talked about God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. If you're still waiting for God to make everything work for you to do what he's asked you to do, you need to get over yourself. You need, you need to step out in faith. Do it afraid. And most of the stuff I've done for the Lord, I've done afraid. I mean, I, I'm not still afraid. I mean, when I first started ministering, I was afraid. And uh, I didn't have a spirit of fear because he didn't give me one. But I was afraid of what people would think. I was afraid of how bad I would mess up. I still sometimes get afraid that I'll run out of something to say. <laughs> but I'm the only one that gets afraid of that. <laughs> Nobody else walks in fear with that one. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> BB promises me if that ever happens, she'll grab a microphone and help a brother out. And my husband, <laughs> won't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. She'll, she'll preach up a storm if I run. I'm done. <laughs> uh, but you're, you don't have to be qualified to do what God called you to do. And, and I'm not, I don't know if any of you may be watching by video. I don't know if any of you feel that way. But if you do, get over that feeling because that's, that's just the enemy trying to keep you out of what God called you to do. Do it afraid. Just say, you know, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Because like I said, much of the things I've done in my life have been that way. I mean, it's, but God has honored it. He's blessed it. And I believe he has you, and I believe you will continue to do that. So don't, don't get hung up on being qualified. This week, we're going to learn no one just falls into sin. No one just, you, you, we don't just walk along and stumble and fall into sin. It doesn't work that way. We're going we're gonna to learn how to, number one, avoid uh, number two, deal with temptations. And there's a, there's a prescribed thing that we'll see in David's temptation here. We'll, we'll see something, we'll see a few things that I believe will really help all of us to avoid temptations. Now, your temptation will not be David's. It'll be something different, but we'll all in this lifetime deal with temptation. We just will. And if we ever think we're too holy to deal with temptation, we are already blew it anyway. But the deal is we can, we, can, we, can, we can have boundaries, we can set up things to avoid them, and also how to deal with them. And so we'll, 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 we're going to look at that. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Samuel. Sheila, do you like, can you, you got a new King James? I'm going to let you read a little bit if you, if you want, if you don't mind. And then I'm going to probably read a couple of verses and then, and then I'm going to unpack some stuff, but we'll just kind of work, work along here. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 in the New King James Version. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Go ahead. Verse 2, too. 
Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is it not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was pro- war prospered. Okay, hold on just a second. Now, I want to I want to set up a couple of things and then we're going to backtrack here in a minute. But I want her to finish the story. I wasn't sure. I'm going to let her finish the story. But I, I do want to set this picture up. David uh, was in his home. He looks out the window and sees Bathsheba on the rooftop taking a bath. Okay, there's a lot wrong with this picture. A lot wrong. One, David should not have been at home. This was the spring when all the kings went to battle. So much so, we won't turn there, but if you, if you go to First Chronicles 20, they tell the same story again, and they emphasize the point that Joab was in battle, but David stayed at home. One of the first lessons of overcoming temptation is being where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. That that's the that is a big key. What was David doing? David was where he didn't belong. You say, well, it was his house. Yeah, but he wasn't supposed to be there. He was supposed to be off at the battle. This is so paramount when you think about the anointing of God, when you think about what you're called to do, when you're walking in that, you don't have time for the other nonsense. The old folks were not wrong when they said an idle mind is a devil's workshop. That is one of those things that is not a a scripture, but it's so scripturally based The moment you get bored, the moment you get idle, the moment you quit stretching towards something is the moment that all kinds of temptation. Again, it may not be the temptation. Don't get hung up on David's temptation. Temptation's temptation, sin is sin. Okay, let's don't get hung up on that. You may be tempted in a whole different arena, but but, but the temptation will come when we don't know or, or where we're not where we're supposed to be. The other thing that proves David was bored and didn't really, and really had, had lost something, he was up at night strolling around in the late evening when probably, the truth be known, he was probably sleeping most of the day or doing other things rather than occupying his mind with the kingdom. He was sidetracked. And then so many times I've heard preachers preach this and totally excuse Bathsheba. Was David wrong? Absolutely David was wrong. But listen, the, 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 the houses were made in that day that you could use the rooftop. I mean, there's, they're going back to that some. Uh, apartments especially. I was over at Nick's where he takes care of that. And they have a whole, it's like a whole... Um, another area to the condominiums because you have the roof and the picnic tables and all of that and you have views and stuff so you see that even today but but she but listen when they were up on that roof she had enough sense to know that the 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 castle could see her too so she's not innocent in this and of course he sent for her and she came too But where, did it, where was it conceived in the mind of David? David wouldn't even have seen her if he'd have been on the battlefield where he would have blown. There's something so powerful about stepping into our call and, and doing what we're called to do. And you, and you may be sitting here saying, well, I don't know what I'm called to do. Yes, you do. You just ain't doing it. You may not know the ultimate call, but you know the next thing the Lord told you to do. 
That's a daily, Sheila hit it a minute ago, the, the divine assistance for daily living, that'll, that'll walk you into your call. What, what God call you to do today? Don't, don't get hung up with the, you know, that's so worldly sometimes. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't have a five-year plan. Uh, well, that's not in there anyway. That's a worldly term. I've lived it. I still think it's good to plan ahead as the Lord directs you, but I'm not going to get hung up with that. I think more people step into the things God's calling them to do and they actually plan. Or you'll get nuances, you'll hear things in your spirit, you'll, you'll sense things, and then you just, oh, wow, that's what he was referring to. But the key is daily. Daily, what what God tell me to do? And, and, I, and I love, and me and Sheila didn't talk about this, but it's a great setup. Just like with your family, it's a good work. I feel just as called of God when I feel like, let's see, was it last Saturday, me and you and Nick took off. To me, that was just as called of God as me standing up here delivering the word this morning. Why? Because it was a thing that God set up. Now, it may not have been as productive, but it's still fun. And, it was, and see, it, it refreshes you. There's been several things, and well, I could go into story after story. It's not the point. You find your own story. There, there's all kinds of things. I've said, I hadn't said this in years, but some of the best messages I've ever came up with was when I spent the day with Bibi. Not because she preached to me and told me what to say. It was because I got refreshed. I, I, I'd done that one step, and it led me to the next one. It's not about Bibi. It's not about me. It's about the call of God on your life. When you do what God puts before your hands to do, whatever your hands find to do, do with all your might. When you do that, then God can speak to you about the next step. It's not, it's not about sitting in a room somewhere and just waiting to hear from God. That's what caused David to, maybe that's what David was doing. Maybe he was sitting in a room wondering what God was going to say next and, and instead of just doing what he was supposed to do. Let's, let's keep on going. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah main, remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Okay, hold on just a minute. Uriah was a just man. He's just trying to do the right thing. I mean, this story gets... <laughs> you got to get this. A man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. God didn't take that out of Scripture after David done this. He could have. He could have made sure that didn't hit the headlines. Why did he not? Because David had a heart for God. See, we can have a heart for God and still fall into temptation, still fall into sin. It's not God's plan, it's not God's purpose, and it's not God's desire. But it can happen. And so what do we do? We have the types and shadows of the Old Testament. We have the New Testament uh, spurring us on, as Paul said. And so we can learn and we can grow and we can, we can avoid a lot of pitfalls that we see in the Bible, such as this one. But this, this story is about to get worse and worse. You know, it's one thing for a man or a woman to fall into sin or temptation and miss it, repent, get back up. To me, it's a little bit more serious situation when you get three or four people involved and nobody has a voice of reason. And that's what's taking place here. It goes from bad to worse. 
Me and Babies talked about this many times. Headline news: somebody will do something that's horrific, but then they had a then they had somebody like a wife or a husband that was in on it with them, and it's like, and we're both like shaking our heads, thinking, couldn't somebody have had a voice of reason in this and said, this is not what we should do? That's what, that's what you wonder, why did this not happen? Because this story, one, David took one of his soldiers' wives to his own. Now he's trying to get the guy to go down there and be with his wife so that David don't get blamed for the fact she's pregnant. And David's got people participating with him. That's why we've got to stick to the word. In church, we've seen this happen, where a charismatic leader got, got going in a wrong direction and takes several people with him, sometimes for years. And it's like, did nobody wake up and think, you know what, that guy's crazy. I mean, I, you, you, I don't even have to tell you the stories. You can fill in your own blank on that. There's been many. That's why many times I've said it and I'll continue to say it. Why? It's protection for you and me. When I get out of this, you ought to run. And when you get out of this, you've already ran. The Word of God is what keeps us. I mean, we're sealed with the Spirit of God. That's going to get us to heaven. But what keeps us in our daily walk is understanding what this says and living by it. Following his prompts. Because his prompts will line up with this. There's, there's, you know, we say new revelation, but the reality of it is it's new illumination. Why? Because there's nothing new under the sun. It's just we got it one day. And there's nothing, there's nothing new to what was here. It's still characterized under, it's still the character of God. Does that make sense? I mean, just a little point of trivia about nothing new under the sun. Bathsheba was on the, on the rooftop. And, and I always thought this was interesting when you see the Bible prove things that we walk in today that the atheists and the secular world don't understand. <laughs> But that whole thing, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said there's nothing new under the sun. When, when Bathsheba was on the roof, the th same thing we do today with roofs, they done then. When you, when you built that type of roof, you had, to put a, you had to put a barrier around the roof's roof so nobody would walk off and kill themselves. Flat, flat top buildings still do that today. Angle roofs like this don't, but if you have a flat roof on a commercial building, they have a wall Correct me, guys, y'all about this high. Why do they do that? A lot of people, and aesthetically it looks better, but its main thing is nobody's up there working and they're working on something and all of a sudden they back up and fall about 50 feet, I mean 50 floors. It's a safety parameter. But it started in Deuteronomy 22. I think I'm right on that. Let's see here. Uh, Deuteronomy 22.8. This stuff works. We're still working it today. Another thing you'll find in here, I don't know the address of this one, but you can search it and find it yourself. After seven years, relieve their debt. What does the credit bureau still work on today? Seven years. <laughs> what does seven represent? It's complete. Okay, you, here's your, you know. I'm telling you what, you live by this book. Go ahead and finish, or go ahead and read some more. Now when David called Uriah, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote okay, in the I'll letter. Stop right there. This, you just can't miss this. Back up and read that again. He, David wrote a letter, and he sent it by who? Uriah. You just don't get much wickeder than that. Go ahead, go ahead and read it. Just understand who wrote the letter and who's, who he sent it by. Go ahead. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set your eye in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. 
So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Okay. Uh, you, you can stop there. We'll, we'll let you finish reading that. It's just a bunch about the communication with the king, and there's no, there's, it's okay, it's good stuff, but I want to back up. And I want, I want us to look at a couple points before we leave here. David had gotten so consumed with his sin that now he's just doing crazy stuff. I mean, it's all crazy, but it gets crazier. The guy that he slept with his wife, not only has he tried to deceive him to get him to go do the same thing so he wouldn't be guilty, now that didn't work. Now he sends a letter, a death warrant, in his own hand, Uriah's own hand, to take to his commander so that he could be killed. I have found David, a son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. What am I saying in all this? Here's what I'm saying. You can have a heart for God and fall into temptation. You can have a hot heart for God and miss it. Why is that? What am I doing? Trying to talk you into missing it? No, I'm trying to talk you into picking yourself up when you do miss it and realize God loves you. And his, and his sacrifice is sufficient. And to not walk in condemnation over the little things in our life that we miss. Some of the things, I don't know about you, but some of the things I beat my, or, or the enemy tries to beat me up over are things that's not even wrong. In the sense of what David committed. I mean, I've beat myself up before because I didn't read enough of the Bible. It's never right to beat yourself up because condemnation only brings more condemnation. That's the point of this whole thing, is if we get into what God called us to do, we stay in that calling, we arrive at where we're supposed to be, then we avert so much temptation. We avert it. Let's, let's look at the New Testament right quick. Just hold your finger there. Go, go with me over to the book of James. But uh, first, uh, James chapter one, verse 13, let no one, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. See, people have twisted the word of God. Sometimes I've I've heard people do this. Well, David went through that. God wanted David to go through that for this reason or that reason. Or God wanted you to go through this. for No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Get over that. This, you need to understand this verse here. God doesn't tempt any man or woman with evil. That is heresy. And people that preach that are preaching heresy. You say, that's strong, Pastor. Yes. It needs to be strong. It needs to be 100 proof. You need to understand that because this is a big part of fighting temptations. Because if we ever for a moment think God's doing it to us, then that makes it okay. It's not okay. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. How did David get drawn away and enticed? He was at the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. That formula is still accurate today. Verse 15. 
Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, always. When, when desire is conceived, in other words, you have to have a thought, you have to have a, there has to be something conceived. Remember the beginning of the message, we don't just fall into sin. There's, there's conception. There's a, there's a conceived idea. Now the enemy's the one that's doing the planting. Now that's one thing we can point to. Without the enemy, we never, I don't think we have the capacity to sin without the enemy enticing us. We say our own desires, but, but that enemy is one that puts our, it go all the way back to the garden. I don't have time to preach the whole thing, but Adam and Eve was just living in the garden. They weren't thinking bad or they weren't thinking good or evil. They were just living. They was communing with God every day. Then the serpent showed up and that's when the desire came to be as smart as God. So watch the, well, let me just keep reading. The desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, what's, what's that mean, brings forth death? Does that mean anybody that has ever committed a sin or after they're born again don't make heaven? No, that's not what it means. It means it produces death in your life versus life. Over in Corinthians, he deals a little bit about sin to death. In other words, not repenting and not making Jesus Lord, not, not walking in the forgiveness of Christ. That'll lead you to, to ultimate death. But sin in of itself produces death. It don't produce life. And, and we're not talking about just adultery here. We all are fully aware that that's a sin. But we're also talking about the sin of gossip. The sin of backbiting. The sin of, of judging. There's a lot of sins in the Bible. Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, just in case you miss the fact, and I miss the fact that God doesn't tempt anybody, James comes back and reassures us of that. He said, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Temptation and sin is not a good gift. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variance, variation, or, excuse me, or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth from the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. In other words, this is, this is huge in the body of Christ. Because people testify sometimes and they say, well, you know, I've done this and I've done that. And there's nothing wrong with this. And, and God brought me through that. And then people get this picture in their mind that God actually brought them through that temptation and that, that sin to teach them something. No, God was there to pick them up when they blew it. I mean, it's very simple, but sometimes it gets, it gets muddled in our mind because we hear some bad teaching and we think, you know, It's pretty clear what James says. Let no man or woman think when he's tempted that he's tempted by God because God doesn't tempt anybody with evil. Never has, never will. It's kind of, it's kind of like that same thing, you know, well, God, you know, God put this on me. I mean, I've, I've heard preachers say that if God wanted to put sickness on them to, to glorify his name, there's, there's will and God's never put sickness on anybody. What's the cross that some of the apostles did bear? Oh, for his namesake. What were they? They was beaten. They was left for dead. Why? But it wasn't, again, God wasn't doing it. The enemy was doing it, trying to stop the message of Christ. What's all this saying? Real simple. God's good. The devil's bad. God's good. The devil's bad. We need to quit trying to mix muddy water and clear water. James talks about that. Don't let, don't let that man think he's going to get anything. I'm gonna, you need to hear this. John 10, 10. We, we, read, we say it all the time. This time we're going to read it. John 10, 10. I've got bookshelves full of books from Bible college. Some of them... Some of my red was like digging ditches. 
It was easier to dig a ditch. And I'll never forget, one of them was a, a theological book. I started reading that thing. I'm thinking, wow, this is harder than a, than a, than a mattock and a shovel on a, on a heart. I mean, it was hard to read. And you say, why are you telling us all this? Here's why I'm telling you all this. I've got bookshelves full of books when I went to Bible college. But let me tell you something. Right here in John 10.10 10 is the dividing line of all theology. This is, this is what we hang our hat on. This is what we know, this is what everything lines up to. John 10.10, 10, the thief, which is the devil, does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So what did the enemy mean for David? To destroy him. What did God do? He said, I'll build my kingdom upon his throne and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the God we serve that can take our complete mess, turn it into a message, build whatever he wants to on it, and nobody can destroy it as long as God's in it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't know about you, but this gives me great hope in my future. Why? Because I ain't blew it as bad as David, and God still used David to build his kingdom. Fast forward to the New Testament. I hadn't blew it, and neither of you that I know of. Maybe somebody watching, but no, I don't know of any of you that have. Nobody in this room, probably nobody listening to me, has ever blew it as bad as Paul, but yet Paul's quoted more than Jesus. He wrote two-thirds of the content of the New Testament, and he was killing Christians when he was called. You want the best hope you can ever get in your life? You want to stay out of oppression? You want to stay out of depression? Read the Bible. It'll always give you hope. Why? Because when people thought they were down for the count, God said, I'm going to do something just absolutely miraculous in their life. We talked about that last week or, or the week before, the, the low to bar of Mephibosheth, how God, how God used David to, to bring Mephibosheth up, how he took these people that were broke with David's mighty men. God's always wanting to use those outcasts. Why? Because he takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. <laughs>